Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by Allstate, the Searle Funds at the Chicago Community Trust, and CIBC, and by the support of these donors. Good evening y bienvenidos to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Alex Hernandez of Univision Chicago Primera Hora, which airs every weekday morning at 5 and 6. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. Mexico's Supreme Court has decided that women should not be criminalized for having an abortion. We have a local reaction. A new report by ProPublica says Illinois Child Welfare Agency is failing to serve Spanish-speaking children and families in their language. A look at how some Chicagoans have been showcasing their Mexican pride in honor of Mexican independence. And Mexican artists from across the country perform at this weekend's Sonido 18 Fest in Pilsen. And before we get started with tonight's show, we have a programming note for you. Chicago Tonight Black Voices, hosted by Brandis Friedman, will be moving to Saturday evenings at 6.30 immediately following this program. And if you can't join us on Saturdays, you can now catch both programs when they re-air on Sundays beginning at 10 o'clock. We hope you'll join us then. First off tonight, in a major ruling, Mexico Supreme Court has decided that women should not be criminalized for having an abortion. The decision makes way for full legislation of abortion statewide in Mexico. The move comes just weeks after a Texas law took effect that bans most abortions in the state. Joining us to talk about Mexico's drug criminalization move are Illinois State Senator Karina Villa, representing West Chicago, and Giselle Gonzalez, an abortion rights advocate. Thank you both of you for joining us today. And I want to start with you, Giselle. What are your thoughts on Mexico's Supreme Court abortion decision? Well, I think that it's a it's a great um, a great step towards the right direction and towards um, I think this also gives hope that we can see some progressive change um, in Mexico, a country that historically um, you know has been very conservative, um, especially due to the um, very heavy religious influence that's um, that's within the culture. Um, and so I think that this is a, a great step to um, to to better and and, and further change. Senator Villa, what impact will Mexico's decriminalization have on Illinois just when Governor Pritzker is urging Congress to protect abortion access? Absolutely. Well, as you know, Alex, Illinois is one of the most uh, progressive and welcoming states for women and making sure that we have protected the rights of women to make uh, their own reproductive decisions. And so we think that this is... Um, uh, we already know, I was just at Planned Parenthood in Aurora recently, and they told us that they've already started to get calls from Texas, women in Texas, saying that they're coming to Illinois uh, to, to seek um, their medical attention because of this new law in Texas. It's almost like it was uh, preventable, right? I mean, not preventable, but it was expected that this would happen or could happen. Senator, I want to stay with you for those who don't know what is the Reproductive Health Care Health Care Act, sorry, and what are your constituents doing to make sure women have access to reproductive health care? So this, um, the Reproductive Health Act that we passed in 2019, many brand new freshman females were elected to the state legislature and we said we are here and we are going to protect women in the state of Illinois. So we made sure with this piece of legislation that we did just that, that the decision of when to have an abortion would be between a woman and their doctor and their health care provider. So, uh, but, but, you know, these clinics offer so much more than just abortions. In fact, they cover services such as STDs, testing, and um, a wide array of, of benefits for men, women, and, um, and, and others. So it, it's, it's amazing. According to the Pew Research Center, about 52% of American Latinos want to ban abortions, and 41% want to legalize abortions. Giselle, what does reproductive care look like in Latino com communities, and what are some of their thoughts on abortions? 
Well, I think that um, it first needs to be understood that um, sexuality and in general, the conversation of reproductive health is a very taboo subject in the Latinx community. And a lot of that is heavily influenced on the um, machismo culture that is embedded or the religion um, of Catholicism that is embedded in the culture as well. So it's almost viewed as this shameful or this um, you know, taboo subject to even talk about. And so I think that within the community, the, you know, within, within the culture, um, we need to start by first, um, having these conversations, conversations in safe spaces, um, where we start to, um, to make this less taboo and, and make this a, con a comfortable conversation to talk about. Um, and I think once we get to that, um, we'll start having, we'll start seeing a better change in the way that, um, the work is being done within the community because, um, you know, we continue to to partner up with with um, Latinx organizations mm -hmm. and we continue to partner up with community members to have these conversations because we want community members to be healthy, right? We want them to to take care of their reproductive health. Um, but if, if you know, it, it, we need to have these conversations first right. so that they feel comfortable enough to access these resources that are available. Um, and it's crucial because um, Latinx women are one of the um, highest risk for cervical cancer. So we need to make sure that women are getting their, um, their pap smear screening and that they're, um, you know, having these conversations with their physicians that, that they feel comfortable having these conversations with their, with their doctors. We actually spoke with uh, Jacqueline Rodriguez from Metro Price International, who is part of the anti-abortion movement. This is what she had to say about recent abortion protests in Mexico where protesters clash with police, actually. Let's, let's listen. I think it's sad. I don't, look, I don't look up to that. I don't agree with that. Um, women can fight in a different way. I completely agree. A lot of them are being abused. A lot of them don't have a voice. Um, um, unfortunately, they don't even know that there's resources for them to be helped. I understand, but that's not the way to fight. That's not the way to fight is by destroying the city. Uh, and this question is going to be for both of you, actually. I want to start with you, Senator. Um, why do you think it's important to legalize abortions across Latin America and other countries when we see what's, what's happening, actually, or what has happened just, just now in Mexico? Alex, women have been having abortions for as long as there have been women. And whether you do it safely in a doctor's office with care, or you do it hiding in, you know, in a bathroom at your home, women are going to find a way to have abortions. I believe in healthcare. I believe in healthcare for everyone who needs it. That also means women women who are in these situations where they are desperate. And for too long, we have uh, vilified women. For too long, we have shied away from these conversations uh, of protection where men, you know, have, have gone by and, and just allow, been allowed to be just uh, free of any kind of blame and women are the ones that are constantly being attacked, uh, both physically, emotionally, mentally, and, and with legislation. Um, we need to stop that. Women have the right to be able to say what medical decisions are right for their body. Giselle, I want to ask you exactly the same question. Yeah, I want to go off with what, the, what, what Senator Villa was saying. Um, when you restrict abortions, people die. Women will continue to have abortions. Women have always had abortions. Um, and as Senator Villa was mentioning, um, this is a matter of making sure that women are having safe abortions because banning abortions does not mean that women are gonna stop having them. So if we wanna protect women, we need to, we need to be able to have these conversations and make sure that um, we are making laws that make it accessible for women. And so um, I think, you know, um, prior to, to the, the, the decriminalization of abortion in Mexico, um, the only states that had um, abortion legal was Oaxaca and Mexico City. And so, um, and the other states where it was still being criminalized, um, 
women will sometimes have miscarriages um, and they will be shamed. And at times they will also be punished um, and prosecuted um, for being told that they murder um, a fetus, that they murder um, um, the child that, that they were carrying because um, for a simple miscarriage or something that was out of their control, something that um, was a, was in no way um, in control of-, of In, in of, some um, cases, even after rape which is uh, exactly yeah, yeah. Which is horrible. And so Gis Giselle we have less than a minute but I do want to ask you this last question what is your message for women in the community that feel stigmatized of seeking abortions or reproductive mm -hmm. care we have less than a minute I think um find find a safe space to have a conversation to have these conversations um there are a lot of resources such as Planned Parenthood um here in the state of Illinois Mujeres Latinas en Acción um who have um Spanish friendly resources um, where you could have these conversations and answer your and have your your questions answered. Um, but I think it starts with having these conversations and being safe while, while doing it. Thank you both. That's our time for right now. But uh, I want to thank uh, State Senator Karina Villa and Giselle Gonzalez for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, a new report on Illinois Child Welfare Agency and how it's serving Spanish-speaking families. Twenty nineteen. ProPublica, Illinois, reported that the state's Department of Children and Family Services was failing to serve Spanish-speaking families by not offering Spanish-speaking caseworkers and placing children into homes where Spanish wasn't spoken. This despite a federal consent decree that has been in place since 1977 requiring the agency to do so. A follow-up investigation by reporters Melissa Sanchez and Dua El Dif this past August indicates the agency has barely made any progress in complying with that consent decree in the last two years. Joining us now to talk about these findings is ProPublica reporter Melissa Sanchez. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Your most recent report starts with an e experiment by Cook County Public Guardian Charles Goldberg. Can you tell us what he found? All right, thanks for having me. So the, the public guardian whose job in Cook County is to, to, to watch out for the welfare of kids who are in the DCFS system. He had read our earlier reporting and he knew that the agency had struggled for years with, with following this consent decree. And, and so part of the consent decree, like the most basic part is for DCFS to be able to identify whether a family needs Spanish language services. And so in order to do that, there has to be this form filled out right, right when a family enters the system, when an investigator meets the family, for example, after there's like a, an allegation of abuse or neglect. And the form says, if you're Latino, do you prefer um, services like your caseworker, et cetera, in Spanish or in English? That, that's basically it to the form, English or Spanish. And that form is going to tell you whether then the consent decrees um, like requirements are going to kick in, whether they're going to get a Spanish language caseworker, whether their kid will get placed in Spanish speaking home. And when Goldberg's office last spring decided they, 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 they weren't seeing these papers show up in the case files when they got a, a hold of a case a few weeks in. And so they worried that maybe that maybe those those forms were never being filled out. And so they counted every single case over the course of 10 months that involved a Spanish speaking family that they could tell spoke Spanish because their, their, their lawyers met them and they were Latino and they spoke Spanish. And they counted about 80 cases and not a single one of those files included that form. And so that to, to Goldberg indicates that the agency was was just not complying with the consent decree and and all and there could be like this whole chain of this ripple effects on that family the parents could be assigned a caseworker who speaks english who they can't communicate with their kids could be placed in an english speaking foster home and why wasn't day, why wasn't sorry melissa but why wasn't the ahead. agency compliant with this if if the form was established to the question was established to be asked why wasn't the agency doing this that's a really good question, and I wish that we knew the answer. I mean, it's up to individuals, like the individual caseworker or investigator, to fill it out. But there seems to be um, DCFS it, it is, must not be putting enough pressure or emphasis on this internally because the workers themselves aren't doing it. And and we can understand, like in part, investigators and caseworkers are really overwhelmed across DCFS. Um, but we'll, but it's just it's just not a priority. It's never been a priority. And it and, should be right. 
I mean, it ought to be like the consequence of this, like what we what we found a couple of years ago and what's still happening today is essentially like families get separated for a really long time. If you don't speak English and you get assigned a caseworker who doesn't speak Spanish, you can never really communicate very well. They might have right. to use an interpretation line. It's not very good. And there's just delay after delay after delay of you getting to reunite with your kid. Does DCFS have an accurate account of the number of Spanish speaking clients they serve? They, I don't think so, because because we, we, we're not seeing that form filled out, and that form is what's what's filling their database with whether a family prefers English or Spanish, but if that form's never getting filled out, then it's impossible to get an accurate account. Um, the, the agency has made some reforms since we last published our story. They've updated their database so that now whether a family is considered a Burgos consent decree family is taken into account, but if that form never got filled out to begin with, right. then I don't know if we can trust the numbers at the end of it. This may seem obvious, but why is it important for caseworkers and families to speak the same language? Well, it's it's a relationship. It's not like a quick like transaction at McDonald's. It's a it's a relationship that you as a parent have with somebody who is monitoring your your ability to fulfill a number of requirements to get your kid back. And you want to have a relationship where where it, let's say you miss a meeting, you miss a parent meeting, or you miss like therapy. You want the caseworker to be able to call you easily and be like, hey, look, like you're you're falling out of line or like what happened to this? Like and you can't have those kinds of conversation and that kind of check in if you don't speak the same language. Um, so you might need that interpretation line, which has had all sorts of problems in the past. Um, it's, it's just hard to build a relationship. And without that relationship, it's just a lot harder to get your kids. Who's responsible for monitoring compliance with the consent decree? So right now, nobody. Right now, there there has been a federal court monitor in in other years, like back when when it first got signed in the in the nineties. I mean, it got signed in the seventies, and then there was monitors that kind of on and off. But in the nineties was the last time there was like an official federal court monitor. And after that, there's there's been nobody. There's an organization called MALDEF, the Mexican American um, Edu Legal Def Education and Legal Defense Fund. I might have that off a little bit. Um, that's considered the plaintiff's attorney. So they're the attorneys who are representing the Latino families in this litigation, which is still ongoing. And, and so their job as lawyers should also be to like hold DCFS to account, but they have been unable to for years to get records from DCFS that would let them do its job. And they say yeah. it's because DCFS and the AG's office, which represents uh -huh. DCFS, isn't providing those records, but they're also not they also don't seem to have prioritized this. Are they, are they doing something? Are they even trying to address the, the, the shortage of bilingual caseworkers? So DCFS says that it is, but it's really hard, and we, we empathize with that. Um, there's a lot of turnover at DCFS, and especially with bilingual workers. It's a hard job, and bilingual workers feel like they have higher, they have tougher caseloads than, than their non-bilingual counterparts. They have to translate all the records, for example, for the families. So it's a lot of work. So it's hard to keep people on staff. DCFS says it's constantly hiring and they do job fairs and posts all over the place. But but it's a hard it's like it's a hard job to do. People don't want to stay in it long. Okay. Um, and so yeah, even since we last reported our story, even though they've done all this hiring push, they actually actually have fewer bilingual workers than they did yeah. then. Melissa, we have we have less than a minute, but I do want to ask you um, about Governor um, of Illinois, J.B. Pritzker, who has signed a bill that created a task force to examine racial impacts of DCFS policy. How might that task force help address the situation? Well, I think there's the, I mean, the, the, the language part of it, what, what Burgos addresses is, is a tiny part of what's included in this task force. They're looking at um, cultural and like language as, as part of you know, these disparities. So I think having the eyes of state legislators and, and advocates who are on this task force will be good for DCFS and, and the Shriver Poverty Law Center and some uh, Latino legislators are really prioritizing this. So I think they're gonna use this task force as an opportunity to really hold DCFS to account. Melissa Sanchez, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Up next, sights and sounds from this week's Mexican Independence Day celebrations. Stay with us. Celebrations for Mexican Independence Day are underway in Chicago. Our reporter, Joanna Hernandez, and producer, Acacia Hernandez, spent some time in Little Village this week to hear from community members on how they're celebrating and what Mexican Independence Day means to them. 
It's beautiful to be able to celebrate every year and remember our Mexican independence. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. You know, it brings a lot of excitement and a lot of happiness to me. To, you know, for me to know that other people are are enjoying themselves and they're in the in the Mexican spirit. It's beautiful. There is so much to learn and so much to continue to fight for. We come from a people. We come from a country. We come from a nation that has fought. People of color have been fighting for decades for their rights. We're still continuing to fight. And so I look at Mexican Independence Day, I look at my community, I look at the, particularly the women of our community who have stood up and fought so hard, and I hope I'm paying them proper homage. I hope that what we are doing makes them proud. Y mi orgullo es que todos, la mayoría de los mexicanos, somos gente que viene a trabajar. Venimos a buscar un futuro para nuestras familias. My mom, my aunts, my grandmother, none of them had it easy. And they all had to fight to get to this country. They all had to fight to be where they are um, in their own lives. And I feel like I have a responsibility to fill some pretty big shoes um, in my family, but also to make it easier for my daughter. We got to show off our accomplishments and our influence. We have influenced this United States so much that we're more American than Kraft cheese. That last gentleman was Baltasar Enriquez with the Little Village Community Council. Actually, the Mexican independence movement started in 1810 by priest Miguel Hidalgo, but it wasn't until 1821 that the country gained its independence from Spain. Hispanic Heritage Month also kicked off this week with celebrations. Arts correspondent Angel Idowu takes us to Pilsen, where the National Museum of Mexican Art is hosting its first ever music festival with help from Mexican artists around the country. Sounds of 18th Street. That's the theme of the National Museum of Mexican Art's first ever music festival, Sonido 18. For uh, a lot of the South Side Mexicans and Latinos, was it known as Pilsen? Is it actually known as La 18? That's how it was commonly referred to way back in the day. Now Pilsen is used a lot more, but sort of paying homage to La 18, 18th Street as sort of the identifier, the way that we used to identify uh, Pilsen as. But it's about more than just a tribute to Mexican culture. Can you tell me more about the stereotypes that you hope this festival breaks or brings attention to? We're not a monolithic culture. Uh, there is so much richness and diversity in who we are. And I think this festival is really allowing us to, uh, giving us an opportunity to really sort of showcase these different artists that are of Mexican descent. But I mean, we've got artists who are gonna be spinning house music, singing a little bit of Dusty's and Oldies, some ranchera, some folk music, and electronica. And so it's really sort of um, uh, reggaeton as well. So it's, it's really a very eclectic music festival. Among those featured vocalists is local up-and-coming artist, Eliza Silva. When it comes to my songs, I really try to reveal parts of myself that even I like have trouble accepting. From reggaeton to jazz to neo-soul influences, Silva describes her sound as experimental. My songs, I'm very like self-reflective and I just really try to get to the bottom of what's bothering me. I feel like a big part of my life was just, you know, a lot of people trying to bring me down, trying to influence me, trying to put a lot of stuff in my head. Especially with music, making more songs and all that, it really made me recognize who I am and my worth and what I'm really here for. And it's like nothing else really matters as long as I'm focused. <laughs> As for performing in Sonido 18, Silva says she is eager to bring people together through the sounds of her story while sharing the stage with other Latino artists. Especially the state of the world, music is really all we have that really could just pick you up. Every song has a story. And if, you know, even if the songs don't have words, you could really feel what's being, what's trying to be translated. So I just feel like that helps everybody in many forms, in many situations, because it brings a lot of clarity. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. 
Silva actually plans to release a live album this fall and debut her first EP early next year. And while you may have missed Silva's performance at Sonido 18 Fest, there are still other performances in Harrison Park until night tonight and more tomorrow. Tickets are free, but re registration is required. Visit our website for more information. That will do it for our show this Saturday night. Be sure to check out our website, wttw.com news for the very latest from WTTW News. Enjoy Brandis Friedman tomorrow night for Chicago Tonight Black Voices. She'll talk with community organizers about their work to find black women and girls who've gone missing. Plus, flowers that empower. A look at Blomacing Farm to Base Flores on Chicago's South Side. And remember that starting next week, you can catch Chicago Tonight Black Voices on its new day and time. That's 6.30 on Saturdays following this program. Don't forget also to tune in to Primera Hora on Univision Chicago every weekday morning. I'll be waiting for you. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, I'm Alex Hernandez. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy, stay safe. Buenas noches. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that's proud to serve its community through pro bono legal services.